right. We are back on the air. Dr. Mike, it's episode 35. The bald men are back. We've got another, bald men are back. another episode coming to the airwaves for our lucky listeners. Lucky listeners. Yeah. Hi, mom. <laughs> yeah. We've got at least one listener. We've got at least one. I don't even know. I don't think my mom, I hope my mom doesn't listen to this. Actually, that would be embarrassing with some of the stuff that I have a tendency to talk about. Yeah. Don't listen, mom. Turn this off, mom. So it's been a couple of weeks and uh, that would make us two weeks closer to being pain free at hundred. So today um, on the, our, our mission, our centenarian project mission towards being pain free at hundred years of age, um, let's talk a little bit about injury recovery and, and getting back to, back to the gym, back to sport, return to play, whatever it is. Um, it's one of the questions that, that comes up naturally with, uh, with people that have experienced an injury, they've reached out to us for help. And then one of the first questions that you're going to get from someone that is very motivated, is very active, is going to be, when can I lift heavy again? When can I get back to the gym? When can I do insert X? Um, and so that's a, it's a conversation that we have a lot. And, uh, and we do have, I guess, a, a high level framework that kind of supports this. And then the details are going to be a little bit different for each person in each situation. But I thought, why don't we step through that today? And we can even take like a, a fairly standard sort of presentation that's going to be pretty common that people are going to resonate with a little bit. And, uh, and we'll talk through it and uh, we'll explain the the bold perspective on how we do these things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's especially common right now too, considering, you know, for my practice, and again, I don't see as many CrossFitters as, you know, maybe I did three years ago, but we still get a, a good amount of, of CrossFitters or at the very least functional fitness people in my clinic. And again, we just had the open coming up. We just had whatever 21 point, infinity where there was you know dumbbell snatches and burpee box jumps and all that other stuff and then we had the quarterfinals which you know i did have a handful of patients actually make it to that that next step in the quarterfinals so you know for me anytime you see a workout like that you know you know that you're going to be getting some phone calls <laughs> phone calls sunday night about somebody wanting to do it you know repeating on monday and needing to tune up monday morning and and all that fun stuff so yeah let's let's talk about what we look for um, you know, kind of after the diagnosis, right? We've got the diagnosis or you've got, you've self-diagnosed yourself with, with something going on like that and, and, and what happens afterwards. Yeah. I guess maybe one of the points to start from is that necessary, just being pain-free is not necessarily um, the entry point to just dive back in to these activities because um, that can be the mistake. It's a mistake that I've made in the past and, you know, that had disastrous <laughs> outcomes really but you know that is the that is the challenge because in a sense we almost have to pull people back sometimes um and they don't like that always so it's a communication piece for us to explain it and i guess that's why we we do this today but that uh that pain-free situation can come around sometimes pretty quickly but it doesn't necessarily mean that these structures are in the body are ready to get back into that activity and get exposed to those those challenges again. So, you know, if we take a, a fairly, um, let's call it a fairly standard kind of presentation, which might be a low back injury. You know, this is something that you and I both experienced before. Um, so let's let's say it's a it's an annular tear, which is a you know a, a sprain of a disc right in the lower lower part of the back. Um, so pretty common sort of thing. And then it's something that we, you know, have seen come up recently out of these workouts, um, like the one with the, the dumbbell and the burpee box jumps, there's a ton of bending over and pulling from the ground very repetitively. That's where that, uh, that disc becomes a bit vulnerable. Um, you know, the other time that it might happen is uh, on the, on the second rep of a deadlift or something like that the bar goes back down go to move again and whack you get that big hit in the in the lower back um or standing up from a, a squat dr mike you know and i think that was that was what you experienced last year and they're done that yeah um so so that's kind of what we're talking about and for the people that that listen and have experienced this you know what we're talking about because it's that 
that really quick kind of bang and you just go, oh, shit, something's not quite right now. So we'll, we'll kind of dissect that and use that as our example a little bit. Um, so, yeah, what you, let's say someone's experienced this. They've, they've done this in the gym or somewhere else. They're going to call up. They're going to say, I need some help. Um, tell me what to do next. Yeah, and it's uh, that that first phase is all about inflammation management and and trying to get some of that acute pain to go down. And a lot of times, the the unfortunate nature of it is, you know, the, the things that contribute to inflammation are are largely pre programmed for you in the days, weeks, and months leading up to that injury. So we always get the question, how do I manage inflammation as best as possible? How do I get it to go away faster? Well, if you're asking me that question, it's typically too late because you're looking at things like stress diet and sleep being heavy indicators of the, the magnitude of the inflammatory process um, in conjunction with the magnitude of the actual disease process or the injury process. So we, we always want to try and get that inflammation down and outside of having things set up well, right? Managing diet, managing stress, managing sleep, right? The best thing that you can do is not piss it off again. Um, and, th and that's really what we look to educate our patients with. Take a deep breath, relax. Let's wait for this, this initial wave of immense discomfort to decrease so that we can accurately move into the latter stages of the triage process of the treatment process in order to get you back in, in an adequate way. Yeah. And if we sort of explain, I guess, what's actually happened in that tissue, in that the mechanics of that injury. So the, the disc itself is a, is a fibrous structure, but around the outside of it is ligaments. And so in, in the, mechanics of this injury occurring it we've actually physically injured part of that outer ring of ligament so in the similar way that you might injure a ligament in an ankle or something like that and you get a physical sprain to that tissue you get swelling and you get a response that happens around that um, you're going to get a similar kind of response when that happens in a ligament tissue somewhere else it's just a lot deeper and we can't see it as visually but that that inflammatory process is still going to happen it's going to take up some space it's going to be painful um and, and that just has to play out and it's necessary right we're, we're often so obsessed with trying to reduce the inflammatory process because it hurts in reality the the inflammatory process is necessary right it's it's a part of healing and if you try and stunt that inflammatory process with things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, you try to load that sucker with curcumin or broma, whatever the heck, you know, herb that you like to use, turmeric, right? You're over trying to overload it with turmeric, which save your money. Um, you've got to basically be having a consistent dose of turmeric for, you know, three months before it actually affects anything. Um, that, that inflammatory response is needed for the tissue to heal. And again, we talk about managing stress, diet, sleep, you know, having well-managed stress, well-managed diet, well-managed sleep means that that inflammatory response is going to be just right, right? It's going to be Goldilocks and the three bears, right? We're not going to have too small of an inflammatory response. We're not going to have a too big of an inflammatory response. It's going to be just right, right? If you've, if you've seen Black Hawk Down, you know, Ewan McGregor's character, right? Resident Australian. I'm trying to trying to throw it up to my Sydney folks over there. He's talking about making coffee. It's all about the grind size more, not too fine, not too coarse. Your body knows in knows the degree of inflammation that's needed if it's been set up in a healthy standpoint. So part two. <laughs> Part two of the order of operations. Dr. Mike's on a rampage this morning. <laughs> so that uh, that inflammatory response that you get to this injury. So we're looking at what probably, you know, we sort of say roughly about seven to 10 days. This is going to, you know, it's going to be uncomfortable, probably not going to be moving that well, but that is going to taper off. It is going to get better over that as sort of week, week and a half. And then that's the opportunity to come on in 
this is where we get to do an assessment. This is where we start to look at what has led to this occurring in the first place. Um, is there some functional deficits there that we can actually correct through manual treatment and start to, to bring that back and open that up again? And the goal here is we're thinking to get you back just moving pain-free and just having a full range of motion. We're not anywhere near a return to play and activity yet, but that first stage is just to find where do we have an opportunity to improve this? What actually led to this happening? What can we do? And we're looking for pain-free range of motion before anything else. Yeah. Medically speaking, we're looking for length and strength, right? And we're looking at length relative to the average populace and we're looking at strength relative to the average populace. So at this point, I'm not concerned about your, your, your deadlift ratio or your single leg strength or anything like that. I'm looking for a baseline level of range of motion. And if it's limited, what's causing that decrease in range of motion. And then I'm looking for a baseline level of strength that can be something, you know, as easily tested with a, with a walking lunge, right? Can your, are your hamstrings, lower back, glutes, and abs strong enough to exist on this planet without an overload, right? Pain-free. So uh, just can you exist? Can you be an average active human being? Um, I'm not concerned about whether your strength at this point will enable you to make it to the CrossFit games or, or, or anything like that. So again, function. Function is basic length, basic strength. Yeah, and, and putting a time frame on this this piece, this this section of order of operations is very individualized. So it just depends. Um, it depends how much has been going on in that individual leading up to the injury occurring, how much work that we've got to do to bring that back out again. Um, for some people that is going to be a very short time, perhaps. Some people it's going to be a bit longer, but it just kind of takes what it takes. Um, and, and so this part is, I guess, where we have the conversation around what can we do in terms of activity and, and what is better not to do. And I guess less is more at this point in time. The sort of conversation that I have is um, I, I want someone to still remain active, but in a way that supports a healing environment. So um, generally, that's not within a gym environment. I'm you know, really just kind of suggesting get out and walk, you know, take a walk around the neighborhood. Just don't look at it as a workout. It's not for time or anything like that, but just get out and, uh, and just move the body a little bit. Um, we're not looking at doing like aggressive stretching or, um, you know, mobility exercises or all of that sort of stuff. We just want to support a healing environment within the body because at that stage, there's still healing that's occurring. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, have you ever seen those YouTube videos of uh, competitive power walking? No, but I know what you're where talking they, like, about. Speed walk? Yeah, like that, <laughs> the, that's the not hips. what we're looking for. We have, they're like, <laughs> it's actually that's an Olympic we're... sport. I uh, know that's not what we're looking for when we say go go take a nice leisurely walk around the park. But yeah, I mean, at that stage for this injury in particular, I'm I'm still very very hesitant about allowing them to do any lower body work that's not specifically prescribed by me um you know if they're if they do have access to a traditional gym i'm saying hey go use the nautilus machine do some upper body work just to get a pump in just to clear your mind um but otherwise brisk walking at at the most and then let's let's give our lower body a little bit of a break because anything that you really need to load your lower body is gonna gonna put that axial load on your spine and really irritate it yeah and we're we're kind of checking in pretty frequently through here as well because we're looking for the symptoms to be decreasing you know we're, we're looking for your just your general mobility to be more full so you're waking up in the morning with less stiffness and less restriction and feeling better overall and you know once we're starting to really see all of that washing out and that's kind of married up with uh, the ranges of motion that we're seeing clinically so our tests are getting better and they're getting stronger and we're, we're happier with what we're seeing then we're starting to talk about, okay, can we start to add some stuff back in here? Are we sort of getting to that rehab phase? Um, are we ready for that? Uh, you know, because the other thing that we're thinking about in our mind is that we, you know, we talked about a ligament injury, which is essentially what we've got. And so 
depending on the severity of that, those just have certain time frames that it takes for that to get better. You know, there's not too much that we can do to, to cheat that. So we, we need to make sure that we don't sort of pull someone too early from that, that repair phase. Um, otherwise, you know, what's the chances that they, they come back too early and this just happens again. Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, time frame wise, again, just like any other ligamentous injury, sometimes, sometimes it's four weeks, sometimes it's three weeks. If you're a freak responder, right. Because as you know, there are some people that are just freaks um, in terms of their ability to repair and, and reprocess tissue. Sometimes it's six weeks for some individuals. And that's just the, the nature of the length of that phase is, you know, we want to make sure that the healing process is done before I start allowing you to reintroduce your activities. And even as you start to reintroduce your activities, right, we're still touching base at least once a week and making sure that that things are progressing as we need them to be. So we've got our full range of motion. Um, things are moving well, pain-free in general. The reports that are coming back from our wonderful patient, they're saying, look, I feel good. Um, uh, you know, I'm not hampered by this anymore. I feel like it's kind of like what injury? Um, so then the conversation is what, I mean, we need to, we need to, I guess, explain that, yes, cool. This is really good. We're tracking really, really well, but it's still not yet time to dive back into everything that you were doing before. Yeah. And just like the previous phase was length and strength relative to the average human population, right? That next phase is length and strength necessary for you to complete um, the activity that you're demanding your body be right. So it's, it's different for a CrossFitter than it is a power lifter. It's different from a power lifter than it is, um, a ballerina, right? A ballerina needs more than 90 degrees of straight leg raise and, and more specific strength than it, than a CrossFitter does. So you're looking at trying to have an understanding of what those strength requirements are and length requirements are given their activity level and how do I get them from point A to point B? So you're looking at, you know, for me, this is not work that I really love to do, right? If I try to refer this out to specific trainers as much as possible, because, it, you know, it's not something that I'm unaware of. I'm, I'm almost intimately <laughs> um, connected with some of that stuff still, but you're now getting past the, the, the clinical phase, of this and you're, you're kind of like sub performance quasi clinical. And if we can get you to an educated person that understands your sport and has the time to sit down and chat with you and understand what's going on, then that's going to be in your best interest. Right. I mean, you know, there, there are certain strength ratios that I know personally that work well with CrossFitters. There are certain strength ratios that I know personally that work really well with baseball players or hockey players or lacrosse players or rotational athletes. But you, you've got to find somebody that can bridge the gap between um, clinical care and performance care. And if you can do that, you're, you're, you're going to be much more successful. I mean, principally, what you're looking at is making sure that both legs and both arms apply force equally and evenly. You're looking at an adequate amount of core strength relative to, to, to what you put your body through. You're looking at maybe a month of really slow and controlled eccentric work to make sure that the tendons ligaments are functioning well. And, and you're avoiding ballistic movements again in that time phase. So really focused on single leg, single arm strength, really focused on core strength, really focused on tempo work and time under tension. Yeah. It's a good point that you make. I think about sort of utilizing experts um, in that area because uh, I, I do that as well. There, there is some cases where we just keep it all in house because it's a, I guess it's more on the, uh, less complicated end of the spectrum. And it's something that we can just, we can sort that out and it, it works really well. But then there's other times where I'm happy just to bring in the expert shout out to Nick. He does listen to the podcast, but um, you know, I, I think that's a better outcome a lot of the time for the patient because, you know, I'm happy to maintain that sort of expert model rather than just try to keep everything in house. I think it's a, it's a better outcome for people to have a, a really trusted network of experts that you can refer back and forth with. Um, I think it's just a, it's a better service. 
Yeah, and, I, and I've been on both sides of that coin, right? I have been the the performance expert before in my day, and 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 now I'm not. I don't have the time to keep up on that research. I've I've, I've I'm focused on the, the things that I have to worry about. So you know, you you can't be an expert in multiple fields. You can be an expert in one field, and you can have an adequate understanding of another field. You know, like for me, performance care or something like nutrition. But I'm not the best nutrition coach, and I'm not the best performance coach. Um, you know, you, I, you'd be hard pressed to find uh, 50 doctors on the planet that that I would say, yeah, that dude's better than me when it comes to conservative care. So that to me makes me an expert in 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 my field. But yeah, and again, it depends on the severity, right? A CrossFit Games athlete, I'm not even going to give them a choice. I'm going to say you've got to go see this guy. If you don't see this guy, we're done. Uh, somebody that's just trying to get back to maybe Orange Theory Fitness twice a week. Maybe I can give them a handful of exercise to take with them as they leave that really, really specify, uh, that get, excuse me, really specific in what they want to do. And the person that, you know, does a Peloton class once a week and takes a walk with her German Shepherd once a week, right? We don't even need to get into the performance side of things because, again, that, that normal function of length and strength for relative to the average human being is going to be perfectly fine. So we've taken our athlete with the the back injury now, um, and depending on the severity of that injury, it could be you know let's say anywhere from sort of four to eight weeks by this point. So they've they've been able to go through that acute phase. They've gone through some clinical work with us. Some healing has occurred. They've done the right things. They're starting to get a little bit active. Um, you know, the last sort of phase you mentioned there is like a rehab phase. They're bringing up their their strength. They're starting to 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 work some um, some activation drills and some some unilateral strength and whatnot. So they're getting ready to return to play. What what's a reasonable time frame? Do you think it, for most people to be really kind of you know, in, in most cases, we're probably looking at what do you think about sort of eight to 12 weeks is, is pretty reasonable yeah. and they should be kind of good to go. Usually my goal for every patient that comes in is, is eight weeks. And that's what I try to do. And again, that, that assumes that we don't have any flare ups, anything like that. Um, which, you know, unfortunately for some individuals, there are good days and bad days. And sometimes those flare ups are just completely inevitable, right? You, you can't help the fact that you've got to sit down for 10 hours and, and finish out a report. And then you get up and you, you zap yourself again. So you're looking at a good eight weeks before you're returning to your sport or your activity at about 80 to 90%. And, and, you know, I often have heartfelt conversations with patients and being like, what, what do you stand to gain by in increasing the intensity from 85% to 100%? What do you stand to gain by doing that versus what do you stand to lose by doing that? You know, and, and then we can kind of have that conversation a month later and say, okay, now that you've done everything that you've done, you know, you've, you've scaled the weights, you've kept things nice and low, you've really slowed the speed down of things everything felt good. Okay. Now I've washed my hands of it. Right. And I say, if you want to go up to hundred percent, go up to hundred um, percent. And, and you can see what happens and that's okay. You know, but you're, you're risking the same thing happening again, because you're now returning exactly to the same, the same point. So it's, uh, so it's up to them. Yeah. And it's got to all be put in perspective too, I guess, because sometimes the pursuit of that that goal, that sport, or that you know, whatever that athletic pursuit is, um, it, it's can be such an important thing for that person. Uh, it might be something that really, I guess, it, it's quite an identity defining for them. It's a big, important part of their life. But then, you know, if that goes bad um, and, and that return is too early, and it creates a, an even bigger injury, the fallout from that is is pretty severe because it takes you out of work for one. Um, and so if you're a career person that can become very, very hard and, you know, at the, the long end of that scale, it, it could even affect the, the long-term viability of being able to do that job. So, um, it does need to be managed pretty carefully. Take it from me because I've made a mess of this process myself in my own injury. Um, so uh, it is something that I'm fairly conservative with now in terms of getting people back and, and not doing it too early um per my advice anyway 
but yeah, it is something that we need to we need to be careful with because if we do go too soon, it it can have some bad consequences. Yeah, and there's I mean there's another side of that coin too where somebody you know we may need to try to get them back to 100 percent sooner. Um, you know, there's somebody that relies on their body to, to work and they have been out of work, or there's somebody that, you know, their sponsorships depend on them competing at the next Olympic weightlifting meet or, or prize money from a particular tournament or, or, or whatever it may be. So it's, it's very nuanced. And, and just like everything that we talk about on this podcast, you know, Chris and I, we always have a topic that we want to attack and, and, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a polarizing dude where I, you know, I try to make hard and cut rules and at the end of the day. Right. You know, Chris and I can both attest to this. We'll stop hitting record at the end of this and we'll have a little conversation. We'll be like, yeah, that shit's a little bit more nuanced than what we thought it was as we started talking, out, talking through it. But I mean, principally, it all remains the same. Right. Manage inflammation um, by mostly making sure that you're in good shape before the injury happens trying not to re-irritate it, um, length and strength relative to normal human beings, and then length and strength relative to your specific activity. Yeah, there's just a certain number of things there that we can't necessarily influence and we just have to respect. And then there's some things that we can absolutely modulate that's in our control that, that we have to we have to respect that and we have to move those things around in order to get that outcome. So uh, yeah, you're right. It is completely nuanced and it is like almost everything that we talk about. There's a lot of details and there's a lot of um, individuality in, in how these play out. And, uh, and that's why we love to do this work. That's why we love it. All right. And we love to do this podcast because uh, we're going to be pain free at hundred years of age. So damn right. Poor old Prince Philip. Uh, he didn't quite make it. He was he just, didn't a, make it. He no. was just a <laughs> couple of months shy. It was a couple of months. I, I wonder if that man had pain, I guess let's uh, well, that, I'm sure he had some emotional pain, but I wonder how, how painful the rest of his body was. It was an interesting conversation. I was, you know, talking to someone about this the other day because he's 99 queen Elizabeth is 94, I think. And, you know, arguably they're still in pretty good shape. They get out, they're walking around They're you know, they don't, I mean, well, Philip looked a, a bit decrepit, but you know, the, the queen is, um, she still looks, you know, she looks pretty she good looks for, healthy. Yeah. for mid nineties. And so it, it made me wonder, you know, what is that system like behind the scenes to support um, these, these people in their much later years that, you know, I, I, I assume they have access to everything that they need and they have, a team of people that are, you know, very, um, very attentive to their, their requirements and their health needs and all that sort of thing. But yeah, it made me wonder, like, what are those processes and what are those systems like to support, um, you know, these older, older folks that are are doing so well at that age? Cause whatever it is, man, I want it. (laughs) You want a piece of it? Maybe it's like, like children's blood or something like that. And they like spin it down for the adenochrome or some crap like that. Right. They're, they're actually lizards and they're not real people or something, something. Yeah. And, and, and how that kind of differs from how other elderly people take care of themselves. Right. Like you, you, you get to 65, at least in the States and you're like, Oh, now I've got Medicare, right. This, this government supported healthcare, you know, plan that, that we all get when, when we retire, we get to retirement age functionally. And, and uh, yeah, I'm sure that, that, that differs quite substantially from, you know, what que- what the quality of care that queen Elizabeth could, could obtain in, 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 in her lifetime. And again, you know, maybe, maybe that's what we all need is we all need to see doctors that aren't just pushing pills and doing this and that and seeing people who will tell it to us straight. Yeah, something tells me that she's not just having a diet of tea and biscuits and, um, you know, watching the six o'clock news every day. But uh, yeah. six o'clock, she's, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be in bed at six o'clock at 95, man. I'm toast. I got to watch the, the 3 p.m. news. Maury Povich. <laughs> you are not the father. <laughs> I am not the father. And I'd be like, damn right, I'm not the father. <laughs> Haven't had sex in 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> well we better wrap it up there folks <laughs> this is all getting right, out of guys. control all right we'll, well see you next week